and welcome to another edition of uh, Laser Boston. This is our 10th edition and today we are talking about game design and gamification. Uh, my name is Laura Antonietti and I am the Arts Programming Associate here in our consulate in Boston. Um, but before we continue talking about today's topic, I will briefly introduce Swissnext to those of you who are new to our community. Swissnext Boston is the Swiss Science and Technology Consulate that focuses on creating networks between Switzerland and the United States in the areas of research, innovation and the arts. In the arts in particular, we do that by supporting artists, we support designers, cultural institutions and art schools in expanding their reach in North, uh, North America, um, finding the right partners here and finding platforms to show their work. We have partnered with SciArt Initiative to bring laser to Boston because these events embody this interdisciplinary dialogue and connection that we at Swissnext find so important. Today, we have three wonderful speakers who will be sharing their work with us. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Patrick Jagoda. He is a professor of cinema and media studies and English at the University of Chicago. Philomena Schwab, a game designer and community manager um, from Zurich. And Brenda Romero, who is a BAFTA award-winning game director, entrepreneur and artist from New York. So normally, Julia from SciArt Initiative would be here in person to tell you a bit more about SciArt and laser, but because she cannot be here with us today, unfortunately, she has prepared a short video that we are going to watch right now. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for attending laser today. My name is Julia Buntain Howell, and I'm the founding director of SciArt Initiative. If you're new to SciArt or you don't know much about us, we are a United States based nonprofit, and we really aim to bridge the gulf between the arts and sciences through a number of platforms and programs, including such programs as laser. The other things we do include a residency program where we pair artists and scientists together to embark on a collaboration of their own devising. We have biannual art exhibitions which surround different culturally uh, relevant themes within science and technology. We also have a publication and other types of events such as our networking mixer meetups, our book club, and so on. I encourage you to visit our website at sireinitiative.org if you would like to learn more about us or join our mailing list. Thank you again for attending Laser today. Perfect. So what's on the menu today, we're going to start this event with our speakers presentations and then we'll move to a more um, interactive part of the Q&A session. After every presentation, we will give the chance for one question to be answered before moving on to the next speaker. At the end of the last presentation, we will have 30 minutes for all remaining questions. So with this, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker, Patrick Jagoda. Patrick is Professor of Cinema and Media Studies and English at the University of Chicago. He is Executive Director of Crucial Inquiry and Director of the Western Game Lab. He is also co-founder of the Game Changer Chicago Design Lab and Transmedia Story Lab and a member of the Forecast Lab Collective. Patrick's books include Network Aesthetics, The Game Worlds of Jason Rohrer, and Experimental Games, Critique, Play, and Design in the Age of Gamification, as well as several edited volumes and journal special issues. He's currently working on his next book, Story Lab Narrative Methods of a Transmedia Era. He has also designed numerous alternative reality games, video games, and board games, um, about issues that include climate change, public health, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Patrick is a recipient of a 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship. So please, Patrick, I give you the floor. Take it on. Great. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. And it's so great to be here today with, uh, with these other wonderful speakers as well. Uh, so I'll speak for about 12 minutes, and then we'll have time for a question. So in recent years, games have touched practically all aspects of everyday life, um, including in the United States, games have become a prominent metaphor and form. Uh, and we see this in various places. We see it with reality TV shows, which are basically games. We see this in collegiate and professional sports, as well as esports. We see this metaphorically with a series of films and television shows like The Hunger Games, Ready Player One, Westworld, and Jumanji, um, which emphasize the centrality of competition and chance to contemporary society. 
outside of entertainment, we also see this um, with military training simulations, which have been going on uh, since the Cold War. We see this with uh, national election contests. We see this with the market betting um, uh, in, in economics, for instance. Uh, but the most direct way in which games have become central to contemporary life is through video games and uh, virtual worlds, which now have an estimated 2.7 billion gamers worldwide. So this is a medium that has become uh, larger um, than film, music, and other media, uh, thanks to the amazing work of, of people like uh, Brenda Romero, for instance, uh, who's on this panel. Um, and alongside games uh, for entertainment, we've also seen, seen a design practice of gamification emerge. And gamification um, is a term that derives from behavioral economics. And it's the use of game mechanics in traditionally non-game activities. So in the early 21st century, we've seen um, games applied to business, consumerism, crowdsourcing, education, and marketing, just to name a few different areas that use the structure and logic of games. And for the last two decades, we've had um, many different examples of this, things like Habitica, which is a motivational RPG, uh, Photocracy, which is a fitness game, and even charter school curricula that depend on games um, uh, via achievements, leaderboards, points, progress bars, and badges. Um, even as gamification has become very popular, it's also condemned by, by many people, including game designers. And the gist of the critique is that gamification adopts only the least artistic aspects of digital games. Their repetitive grinding, their achievement-based operant conditioning, and their dopamine-fueled goal orientation. Um, one critic, Ian Bogost, even called gamification exploitation wear um, because of how it uses games. So all the limits of gamification aside, there is a, a longer uh, body of literature suggesting that games have learning benefits. Um, they depend on a visceral and emotional logic because of their interactivity, because of their tangibility, uh, because of their experiential nature. Uh, they garner motivation in a variety of ways. They activate multiple learning styles, not just reading text, but interacting with visuals and um, interacting and participating in a variety of ways. They promote interpersonal learning. Most games are multiplayer games. And finally, they encourage systems learning. They help us think about how complex systems, economic systems, political systems are, um, are, are constructed. And they help us intervene in those and sometimes think about how arbitrary rule sets actually are in order to change them. So in my own work, including my, my last book, Experimental Games, I try to argue beyond gamification. So right now, when people think about games instrumentally, they often think about them as solving problems. This is a very Silicon Valley way of thinking. Um, I'm interested in the ways that games can make problems, the way they can elaborate complexities of say race or gender or an issue like climate change and, and invite people in order to discuss and um, think through those kinds of issues. And I think one reason games are good at that is because of how experimental they are. And when I say experiment, I mean this both in the scientific sense of hypothesis testing and also in the artistic sense of experimental art. And games help us experiment with human choice, with different kinds of identities, um, with um, exploring open worlds, or with forms of safe failure, being able to mis make mistakes and try something yet again. Uh, these forms of experimentation aren't always positive, but they do open up a way that game designers can impact uh, everyday life. So I want to focus for the rest of my time. Um, I work on video games, I work on board games, but I also work on this genre of alternate reality games. And these games are basically scavenger driven um, transmedia games that unfold both in physical space and online. Uh, they don't happen on one screen like a video game. They move across different media, like phone calls that you might get from a character, uh, emails, code breaking puzzles, and theatrical performances, both online via live streaming or in person in a more kind of theatrical way. These stories are also broken into discrete pieces that players have to rediscover and reconfigure. So this is a very participatory kind of game type. Uh, these are never single player games, they're, they're collective. 
And most importantly, they have something called a this is not a game aesthetic. So you're never 100% sure that you're playing a game, even though there are a lot of signals indicating that that's exactly what's going on. And there's a power in that uncertainty, I would say. Um, a few years ago, um, I helped create a collective called the Forecast Lab, intentionally misspelled. Um, and uh, since that time, even though I've been working on these games for a much longer time, uh, we've created a series of games about issues like diversity and difference, climate change, and the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm gonna focus on one of those games, um, just to give you a sense of what these look like and feel like. So in 2019, we created a game called Terrarium. And this was a game that was focused on intervening in climate change uh, at the level of college. And um, our thinking about this was that in uh, 2019 was the first year that over 50% of Americans became concerned believers about climate change. I mean, this maybe tells you a little bit too much about uh, Americans and, and um, our relationship to science, but it was the first time that we got over 50%. Uh, 2018 and 2019 were also years in which climate protests started, especially among young people. So this was a major issue of concern uh, for youth. Also for years, we had uh, been seeing novels and films about climate change, like Kim Stanley Robinson's amazing novel, New York 2140. We were interested in what it would mean in a medium specific way to make a game about climate change and intervene in that way. So we created an alternate reality game that engaged 1,700 incoming students at the University of Chicago to demonstrate the use of game-based approaches for engaging a public in conversations about climate change. And this was a really a deep and long game. It ran from May uh, 2019 to September. Uh, so it was about five months of gameplay in a very method sort of way. Um, I'm going to show you 40 seconds of footage of this so you have a sense of what this looked like and felt like. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Global warming. Totalitarianism. Climate change. Everything from online documents. Puzzles. Student videos. Reverse escape room. Faculty videos. We really thought about it as like a live action role playing game. I was on a group chat. We were communicating around the world. There was a ton of different puzzles. And it also got harder when it went to uh, the live stream. Are you there? Players were interacting in real time with a live actor. We watched those frames very carefully. And I think it broke the game. So I'll stop it there and then give you a quick breakdown of what this looked like. So we didn't announce this as a game. There was an email that went out to all of the incoming students at the university, very basic email saying, hello, welcome to the community. The administration allowed us to hide a postscript at the end of that email that just said PS, and there was nothing after it. But if you highlighted that space, you got a URL that said forecast.uchicago.edu slash terrarium.pdf. And that went to a syllabus. That was a syllabus about um, something called the ends of civilization, including climate change. And um, that syllabus seemed to be from the future, from the year 2022. Students immediately noticed this. They got interested in why this was in the future. And they noticed that there were puzzles built into this syllabus. So they started solving those puzzles. Those puzzles took them to an ultimate URL, the misspelled forecastlab.com. And from there, uh, they started a journey. We created about 50 student videos and 30 faculty videos, all of which claimed that people in a very DIY way had been received communications from the future 30 years hence, um, and we're trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, all of the participants in the game on the designer side wore blue lab coats. So we were very method about these, these um, communications actually coming from the future. We had a logo. Um, and the narrative of Terrarium focused on the communication channel that opened between the then present day of the University of Chicago in 2019 and this group of researchers in 2049. And we communicated with the future via something we call the spore device, which was an organic technology. And we actually built that device. We took a tree, we put it in, a, in, a, in an in indoor space and built this kind of set that we would return to time and time again. We then created four different worlds, each of which lasted at least a week, sometimes several weeks. Um, 
And all of them explored climate change, but on top of it, also looked at things like nuclear disaster, totalitarianism in police states, and overpopulation. Um, in each of those worlds, the players would interact with somebody called an anchor, um, who would be a representative of that alternate version of 2049. They also entered into live streaming Twitch rooms, which were basically reverse escape rooms. And so there were things hidden in this space and people would have to direct the actor to explore different sections and bring puzzles to them that they would have to then solve offline as a community. Um, we also moved beyond gamification. Of course, we said climate change exists, it's happening. But beyond that, we kept the conversation about how to combat climate change very open and very player focused. Um, we had many characters, including heroes and villains. So there's a little bit of fun melodrama uh, to all of this. And in the end of this game, we turned things back to the players and engaged in something called the Futures Design Challenge. And on the last day of the game, students um, who had been doing these kind of climate quests, which included speculative design, so they made artworks um, about the future, included playing little video games that we created for them as well, including with students who are part of our design team. And at the end, these first year students came in and pitched their best ideas for combating climate change in five minutes. There were prizes, there were winners, but there were really brilliant ideas coming from every imaginable di discipline. Um, and so this was kind of the arc of one of the games that we created. Happy to talk about it more, but I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, very interesting um, presentation of yours. Um, I will jump in with one question to you. And the question is, which aspects or stages of development process do you enjoy the most in your work and why? I really like world building. So one thing that's so exciting about games is, of course, they're drawing from uh, fiction, uh, from other art forms like film and television. But there's a unique form of world making and lore uh, that goes into creating game worlds. And I really love uh, thinking of the story and thinking about how to populate it with different kinds of characters. Uh, the other thing I really love is um, thinking about game mechanics. So in a, in a video game, a game mechanic is the verb. It's like what you're doing. If you're playing Super Mario Brothers, it's, uh, it's jumping, it's running. And when you're playing a live action game across a live stream like Twitch, um, we really wanted to engage not in competition, but in asymmetrical cooperation. And asymmetrical cooperation means that um, the actor on one side has access to different information and different mechanics than the players at home. And so they have to work together across this network divide um, to solve puzzles, but also to like create new material. And so we experimented a lot with, with those kinds of cooperative game mechanics. And that was interesting because in uh, US society in particular, most games are games of competition or games of chance. And so uh, cooperative mechanics certainly exist, but they're, they're, they're more rare by comparison. So it was fun to do some research on those kinds of mechanics and come up with our own. Perfect, thank you so much for answering. So we will jump to our uh, second speaker, Philomena Schwab. Um, she is a game designer and a community manager from Zurich. She wrote her master's thesis about community building for indie developers and co-founded the indie game studio Strayfon in 2016. The studio's primary focus is the development of procedurally generated simulation games. In 2017, Philomena was named a 30 under 30 in technology in Europe by Forbes. As a vice president of the Swiss Game Hub, she helps the local game industry right now uh, to grow. Sorry, <laughs> Philomena, please, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome everyone to this short input about fun games with learning aspects working at the intersection of science and interactive entertainment. So this will basically be a little tour through my life and how I ended up doing games that are kind of science related. So I was introduced already. Thanks a lot for that. My studio is called the Stray Fun Studio. We're a 10 people indie team based in Zurich, Switzerland and were founded in 2016. And the Swiss Game Hub has also been mentioned. We founded it two years ago. It's now the first co-working space slash incubator specialized in games in Switzerland. So 
let's start the story at the very beginning. Because back when I was a kid and a teenager, I wasn't really sure what I want to do because I had a lot of different interests. So I really liked writing, I liked painting and drawing, but I also really was interested in plants and animals and music and everything. And also got into just interested in computers when I was a bit older. And I really couldn't figure out what to do with myself at this point. And then luckily through a friend, I found that there is a university where you can actually study making video games, which managed to combine a lot of my interests. So I thought, okay, that, that's a good idea. But at the same time, there was also this whole biology topic that kept haunting me, especially like in later years of school, when we had biology for the first time, I really loved everything that had to do with heredity, blood groups, evolution. I just thought, I thought it was so interesting and, and I wanted to get into it more, but I had to decide. And so I made a deal with myself that I would go and study game design at the Zurich University at the, of the Arts, but as my final thesis, I would make a science inspired game. So after these three years passed and I made lots of cute, colorful games, the time came and I had to choose a bachelor thesis and I decided to go ahead and try and make a game about population genetics. And so this is the very, very, very first sketch back then when the idea started. I wanted to have a game where players had a species of animals, like these ones that you see here. But then at the beginning, they all look very different. But then as players play for an hour or so and make different decisions inside the game, so which kind of biome they live in, what kind of food source they eat, how they interact with their environment, they would evolve into all kinds of different shapes. And so if you let players just play for an hour and come back, they would all look completely different and live in completely different places, having adapted their own style to survive in this world. And I wanted to base the thing, the whole game based on this thing called the five pillars of population genetics, which is basically five scientific topics that when you put them together, um, they are what shape a population, what shapes a species. So things like mutations that can occur and certain mutations will be more beneficial or natural selection. So there is maybe weather changes or there is certain sicknesses that spread and then you have immunity to that. So I want to reflect these five scientific topics inside the game. But I still wanted it to be an entertainment game. So it wasn't supposed to be a learning game where all of these topics had to be visible and you would go through each of them and learn them. It would more be implied in the game mechanics. So I had a lot of reading to catch up with <laughs> since I didn't really have an, or still don't have an education uh, in science. Watched a lot of YouTube videos also. There's some great resources out there that even as somebody who has no idea gives you a very good insight into quite complex topics. So I enjoyed that a lot, soaked up all the infos, um, went to the drawing board, made lots of concepts and sketches. If you count this all together today, it would probably be a book this thick um, from the start to now. So quite a bit of consideration goes into a game. It's as with every other media, right? At the, at the end, it looks very simple, but a lot of work has gone into it. Then I made um, a paper prototype, which we did sometimes at university. So forming everything out of, of um, cardboard and paper, made some prototypes. And then finally, after the three months of The Bachelor, the game looked about like this. Very simple, kind of like chess, where you have a board and you move your animals around by dragging and dropping. If you place a female next to a male, they mate. And if you place the pregnant female inside the nest, she has a baby and they each have very simple genetics that they can pass on the environment changes and you constantly need to adapt. Then I was very lucky to get some funding from Pro Helvetia, which supports um, all kinds of media in Switzerland and also at that point uh, started to support games. And I took that money and decided to travel around with it or some of that money and travel around with it and went to all kinds of different conferences in Europe, in America, but also in Asia. 
and my main goal was to figure out who my target group actually is. Because I thought, especially because the game is so cute and looks pretty simple, I thought my main target audience would be girls between maybe eight and 12 years old. And I liked that idea, but it also scared me a little bit because then I thought I would have to keep the game rather simple in terms of what I add uh, scientifically. But during traveling, it turned out that luckily there were a very broad variety of people who actually were interested in this kind of concept. And it seemed that it doesn't really matter if it's very cute graphics, um, if the topic is there and if the gameplay is captivating and challenging enough, you will have a very uh, wide target audience. So this encouraged me to go all in, make the game more complex, add sexual chromosomes, dominant recessive co-dominant genes. Yeah. And after that, I decided to go ahead and take the project to Kickstarter, where again, we tried to appeal also to the science community where I dressed up one of my classmates as a professor. And we made a video that told you that if you play niche, you get a biology degree. So all more on the humor side, but science sites really liked the approach and picked it up. There was like most of the articles and coverage that we got was actually from science sites. And a lot of teachers and scientists thought it was great that this medium tries to bring their expertise to a wider range of people so they can actually understand what is going on. And so they really helped us a lot in getting the project funded. At this time, we also continued to expand the games community. So we had like a Facebook group and other channels. And after the Kickstarter or during the Kickstarter, a lot of experts that read the science papers uh, and articles came in. Uh, we had like bird breeders, cat breeders, horse breeders, and they really wanted to discuss with us that how we can actually show these genetics in a more realistic way and how fur colors could be influenced by different genes and so on. So that was really great to, to broaden our team's knowledge uh, to make it more scientific. And so with all these people, we kept working on the game, added new parts. All the parts of the animals are inspired by some kind of real life creature. For example, if you have very big ears, then you hear better, but you also um, can cool your body better, which is inspired by the Fennec Fox. Reworked the ads, uh, the art assets uh, some more. And then finally, we had the game, which looked like this. Um, this is an in-game screenshot where you can see a little family of animals. And here you can see one animal that is selected and all its genetic traits. So you can see quite a few things uh, made it in there. So there is um, immunity, for example. So you cannot do inbreeding too much because it will get um, it will get you sick or you can more easily get sick because your immunity is low. There is fertility, blood clotting, whether you are an albino or you have melanism and so on and so on. We really went all in in putting these uh, genetic concepts in there. And here you see also a little family tree of how then you can basically trace where a certain gene entered your population and how it was passed on or where you lost it. And this is the game world that you play in. You have all these different islands that are procedurally generated. That means every time you play, they look a little bit different and you have to adapt to them, adapt to the different um, weather conditions, sicknesses that spread, predators that are around and you constantly move on through these islands and keep adapting to them. Since we had a lot of teachers contact us about the game, we decided to release it for schools for free. So it's exactly the same game that you can also buy. And um, yeah, teachers are uh, getting harassed by their students that they should absolutely put this game now because of, a lot of our players encourage them um, to, to use it. And now we have around five, um, we have around 400, 500 uh, teachers that are using the game in class. And we also made a mobile game that we're about to release, uh, release soon, which is a little more complex in terms of game mechanics, but uh, the genetic system is basically the same. Yeah, and that's only the start of our story. Um, this is me and my business partner, Micha. After we have finished, had finished our first game, Niche, we finished uh, Micha's game that he had started as a hobby project. 
and it looks completely different, has a quite different target audience also. But once again, for some reason, and we don't do it on purpose, it's very uh, science inspired this time based on engineering, where you build these drones. And you can also put like little programming parts. So this game actually teaches you how to program. And now we're heading into the development of our third game, which is called uh, The Wandering Village. And since this will be my game to direct again, of course, it goes into biology and this time also ecology, because you will be building a settlement on the back of a giant creature that walks around. And the game focuses on you trying to establish a symbiotic relationship with the creature, because if you exploit the creature, creature too much and the creature dies, you will ultimately also die. So it shows this codependence and we really want to also have a bit of an analogy to our planet, of course, and how we should treat it and work together towards a better future. Yeah, that was all from my side. We have the QA session after. And if you have any more questions or want to discuss about science and games, you're always welcome to send me a mail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philomena, um, for this wonderful presentation. I really love the biology. <laughs> really great approach. Um, the question that I do want to ask you right now is, do you do all the scientific research yourself or do you have a uh, team or an expert um, that helps you? No, so, so far I did it myself, but of course with the help of all the people in our community and uh, some of them are professors and teachers so we know who to ask when we're not sure and if we do something wrong you can be pretty certain they will uh, catch us and uh, we have to correct it <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you so much so we will move on now to our last speaker um brenda romero she is a ba FTA award-winning game director and entrepreneur, artist, and Fulbright Award recipient, and is presently game director and creator of the Empire of Sin franchise. As a game director, she has worked on 50 games and contributed to many seminal titles, including the Wizardry and Jacked Alliance series and titles in the Ghost um, Recon, Dungeon and Dragons, and Def Jam franchises. Away from the machine, her analog series of six games called The Mechanic is the Message has drawn national and international acclaim, mainly Train and Seo Chan Lead, a game about her family's history, which currently resides at the National Museum of Play. In addition to a um, BAFTA and a Fulbright, Brenda is also the recipient of multiple Lifetime Achievement Awards, a Grace Hopper Award, a GDC Ambassador Award, and many of the games she has contributed to have won numerous awards. Brenda is CEO and co-founder of the Romero Games based in Galway, Ireland. So Brenda, please take it away from here. Okay. Let's see. Okay, uh, so hopefully everything is showing up properly. So um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some board games that I've made and, um, and how board games can document history. Uh, so uh, I just wanna make sure the slide did forward there, didn't it? I don't know if anybody can tell me if it did or yes, not. It did. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I had an issue with it not forwarding before, so good, thank you. Um, so uh, when we think of games, there's all kinds of things that we think of. And maybe you're looking forward to a new game, like I certainly am, or you stayed up too late last night playing games, which I actually also did. Um, and both of these things are, are true for many people. So, or uh, when we think about games, a lot of times we think about stuff like this, you know, sort of FPS games like Fortnite, uh, or big what we would call triple a games like say the last of us 2 um, or maybe minecraft has also taken over your house particularly if you have younger kids um, or maybe you're more of a casual game player um, and people play loads and loads of games on their phones and while this is what we could say a lighter form of game um, there's no need for a huge time investment 
you can pick it up and, and drop it at a moment's notice. But these games are, um, are absolutely financial powerhouses in the game industry. Um, or maybe you're someone like me who uh, loves to play board games. I have a huge collection of board games, absolutely love to play them um, and enjoy playing them with my family on the weekends uh, or holidays. Uh, maybe you are a hardcore nerd like I was. Um, so back in the 70s, I started playing D&D. I was only 11 at the time, uh, but I loved it. Um, or, you know, I sometimes will hear people say that, well, the last game that I played, uh, in fact, was Pong, or there's another one people regularly mention, and that is Pac-Man. Um, and all of these things are obviously you're completely fine. There's a huge range of games. And even going beyond video games, maybe games for you are sports, um, or maybe it's just being number one at something. There's a huge range of games. And when people approach me and say, what is a game to me? It's all of these things. You know, I am lucky enough to make my living from games and I've been doing it since I was 15. Um, and, you know, basically that also qualifies me to say that I've never really had a real job, which is fantastic. Um, but when we think of games, we also exclusively think about fun more often than not. Like, is the game fun or games are fun things that we play? And th these are interesting words that, that are attached uniquely to games. And that's completely reasonable. Um, but let's just think about this. So, um, so this specific image here, this is from the 1980 Olympics. And I don't know where all of you were, but at the time I was a kid and I was in my living room um, with my mom um, watching the game. And my mother was crying as she watched this. So for her, it was, it was practically a religious event. This is when the Americans beat the Russians. And yes, it was absolutely technically a game. I mean, ho hockey is a game, but was this really just a game? I mean, people cried and I've never seen my mother cry at the end of something like say Monopoly. Um, and this specific game came to be known as the Miracle on Ice. Um, or if anybody here is from Boston, um, when the Boston Red Sox won the World Series after I think 351 years, um, it was amazing. I, uh, I was living in Springfield, Massachusetts at the time, um, and it was, it was just incredible. So I remember I was uh, working at a software company there, a game company, and I remember closing the door to a stall in the women's bathroom. And on the back of it, there was a sign that said, go socks. And I thought like there was, there was, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing about the Red Sox. And, you know, kids would, kids were coming into school late, but, but people didn't particularly care, um, you know, because obviously the Red Sox were here and education was here at the time. Um, and you'd go outside, like most of the games went into extra innings and you'd go outside and the whole block, all the lights were on in everybody's house. So it was really a magical, amazing experience to live through. Um, and, you know, they, it, it, sure, again, it was a game, but they didn't write newspaper articles about just a regular game. You know, people, like, lots of people said, you know, like, I can die now because the Red Sox have won. Um, you know, so it was, it was a fantastic time. Or, like, here's another one that's interesting. Again, it's absolutely just a game. But, but games have, have deeply serious and, and symbolic uh, meaning. So this is Kasparov and he's playing and will eventually in this game lose to Deep Blue, a computer. So with games, it means something more to us. It means, you know, it absolutely means something more. It's not all fun and games as the phrase goes. So uh, this is in a bit of an abrupt transition here. Uh, but for three years, I uh, I actually did have a real job, um, sort of. I was the head of a college department uh, teaching games. So I was writing a master's course in Georgia um, and it, it was sort of a real job. And so now instead of making games, I, I'm getting paid to have talking, talked about making them. Um, and so part of the job when you are the chair of a university department is to eat and to go out to dinner, which I did and I did that very well. So I was out to dinner with a guy called Zig Jackson. So this is a a picture of Zig here. It is, in fact, his photograph. Zig is a photographer. He's a very well-known photographer. As it turns out he's actually in the Library of Congress, and he's the only native photographer to be there. So this is one of his pics, and you can see the sign that says Zig's Indian Reservation. And he, he travels all over the country photographing himself with this sign, and he has a, an amazing collection of beautiful photographs. This is another one, uh, a more traditional one, um, a dance, and, and he works to capture native culture in a variety of forms. And this specific image, 
is one of my favorite shots. Like on, on surface, it, it looks fine, right? Except this comes from his degradation series. And if you think about, here's, you know, this is a family and some young kids posing with uh, a native man who's dressed in, in traditional garb. And like, just imagine any other race at all. And imagine grabbing your kids and saying, hey, come on, let's get a picture with the, like that boggles the mind. Nobody would ever do that. That's, it's just, it's, it's surreal. And here's another favorite photo um, uh, that, I, that I like that, of Ziggs, which is titled Indian Photographing Tourist Photographing Indians. So I was at dinner with Zig um, and another, there were other photographers that were also there um, in, in an interesting conversation came up, which was, do you take the picture or not? And I'm, I'm sure this is an age old question that photographers ask regularly, a, a decision they have to make regularly. And, and this was around a specific event that had occurred. So in this case, there, there was, um, there had been a shooting uh, on a reservation and Zig decided he was going to go photograph it. But when he got there, he just decided he couldn't. And so this answer to this question is they're talking about, do you take the, pic the picture or not? I started thinking, I just, you know, take picture output game in is, do you make the game or not? Like, do you make the game or not about difficult human experiences? And I thought, how have I been making games for 20 some years? And I've never asked myself that question or actually never even thought of that question. I wasn't even sure that our industry had ever thought about that question. And the interesting thing is every other medium captures and expresses difficult emotions, except for ours. And so, um, so I, you know, it's, it's, I'm sort of floating this stuff in my head. We fast forward a few months and, and I'll tell you a story about what happened. So this is my kid, this is Mesa. And she was then seven, uh, seven years old. So she comes home from school one day and she asks, uh, what did she do at school that day? And so basically what she tells me is we, we were focusing on the middle passage. And I think, oh, geez, you know, her, her father's West Indian. He's, he's um, half black, he's half Irish. And, and I, so I, I was expecting to have a conversation about this. Um, and so, uh, so I asked her, you know, what she thinks about it. And she sort of goes through the bingo buzzwords, right? She's like, well, the ships came down from England and they picked up some people in, um, in Africa and then they go across the ocean. That's the middle passage. They get to the United States, they're sold into slavery. Um, Abraham Lincoln passes the Emancipation Proclamation, and now they were free. And that was it. And, and so the way she described it, and then she asked me if she could play a game, but the way she described it really, like, there was no emotion. It sounded like some, some Black people went on a cruise. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really surprised at just the levity of this. And so when she said, you know, can I play a game, I thought, yeah. And so I grabbed some pieces. So I'm, I've made this up on the spot. I'm, I'm a game designer and I have loads of prototype pieces around the house. And so I asked her to make me some families. So this is a picture of her um, doing that, you know, painting these pieces. And then when they were all dried, um, when the paint was dried, I started grabbing them randomly and putting them on a boat. Um, this is the boat. Um, it was made quickly, obviously. We didn't, I didn't have time to fully prepare a boat, but um, so I grabbed a bunch of families and she's like, mommy, you're feeding the pink baby and the blue daddy and they want to go too. And I'm like, no, man, nobody wants to go. This is the middle passage. And so, uh, so I make up some rules. So it takes 10 turns to cross the ocean. We have 30 units of food. She has to roll a six sided die every single time when we use that amount of food. And so she's rolling high. And by the time we're about halfway across, she realizes that, you know, we're not going to make it. And so she says to me, she says this to me. Um, and so she asked what to do and, you know, bear in mind, she's seven, right? So, uh, so I say to her, um, well, uh, we can put some people in the water, uh, you know, uh, we can hope people don't get sick and go across. And so, you know, she's, she started, you know, she's, she's really confused about it. And she starts asking me questions, right? Now, mind you, this is after Black History Month. So they've been talking about this, this for a month as if, as if a month is enough, but um, so she started asking me these questions and she said, like, if my brother and sister came out of the woods, like they could get back together, you know, we could get back together and we would still be a family. And, and, you know, and I'm like, no, like, this isn't how it worked. And she's, you know, so she's tearing up thinking about these things. Her father comes home from work, not expecting to walk into the middle passage, you know, but he starts tearing up and it was just incredible experience. Um, and so she made this game, like she, she got it and she got it and she spent time with it. Um, and I ended up calling this game the new world because I'm pretty sure that that's not how it was received um, by those people. 
Uh, and so when this happened to me, the world of game design opened up. And, and I think we are pretty good at expressing some things like fear or joy or sadness or wonder or rage or even pride. Um, and, you know, but this whole exercise showed me that there's way more to that, that there's far more that we can do. And that unlike books or movies or games, um, or uh, games or systems, and systems involve the player and they educate the player and they can create complicity in the outcome. And for me, this was a transformational experience. So I'll show you a few images of, of other games that I made uh, in the same series. So this is, you know, where my people came from. Uh, so this is Patty Donovan, uh, so from, from County Cork, Ireland. Um, and so these are just a few of the images of me making a game about my own family's experience. Um, these are pictures taken, uh, and I, I released the game actually at the MIT, uh, at MIT in Boston. Um, and so I decided to make a series of six games about difficult moments in human history. Probably the best known of these is Train. A train is a game about complicity, and it asks, will you follow the rules? Will you follow them blindly? Uh, without even knowing where you're going. And, and, and it asks the questions like, you know, how can people even let such things happen? Um, I made a game about day and night uh, violence in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and the entire game is built out of all recycled materials. Um, uh, another thing that I've also recently finished is a game um, called One Falls for Each of Us, which is about the Trail of Tears. So it started out incorporating 20,000 pieces. It's now 50,000 pieces. Um, and I've also made a game about Mexican kitchen workers. And this is based on my, my husband's uh, family. And, and if anybody has any Mexican relatives, you know that um, food is something very close to the heart. And it's, it's the way people celebrate everything. It's the way people say, basically, I love you. So, um, so I made a game based on this and you know, a way to carry culture, uh, to, to carry culture forward. Um, also, I've, you know, I've made a game called Black Box, and it's a single play, single player game. So I've already played it. It's only one person, and, and now the game is done. And it's about my own personal struggles. Um, so, you know, when I'm working on these things, I attempt to respect and listen to the subject and let myself be guided by the systems that existed at the time. And I study the systems and then place the player within them. And I really think that games can transform a designer and a player that can bring history alive. Uh, and to explore games, their history through games, I think, is not only possible, but critical. Like, to help us understand, this is a game by Vander Caballero called Papa and Yo, about his father's alcoholism. And it can help us confront things like the Trail of Tears and the scale of the Trail of Tears. Uh, this is a game called Deadbolt by Elizabeth Sampat that, that helps people open up and, and talk about their feelings. And games can also help us heal. They can challenge us. Um, and they are great at telling stories that we haven't told before, like looking at war through the lens of people who are just trying to survive and having to question their own ethics about what they want to do. It can be about immigration or homelessness. Or, you know, when I decided to make Train, which is admittedly a very difficult game, um, I was told that's not fun, and, and somebody else said, oh, don't do it. Um, but I did it because I felt it needed to be made. Um, and I think we need more games like this, a, a ludological, interactive approach to history that allows people to do more than just study it, but, but to look at history systems and turn them into an interactive medium. And that's it for me. Thank you so, so much, Brenda. Um, I'm going to ask the first question. I'm still, I'm still in the head so much with what you just said. It was um, a lot of like beautiful and crazy information, uh, especially the cultural aspect behind that. Um, found it, I found it incredible, like the work that you do um, with, with those games to address that. And therefore I do want to ask the first question. Um, what do you think is the most powerful tool that games can use to address those cultural challenges that you have mentioned? Um, empathy. I mean, without a doubt, it's empathy. If you, I, I feel strongly that if you, if you can, if the designer feels, the designer first needs to feel whatever it is they're conveying, and then, and then getting the player to feel attached to something. 
Because if the player doesn't feel attached to it, they're not going to care if it goes away. They're not going to care what happens. So um, getting the player to empathize with the subject matter or with people in the subject matter is critical. Why do people make the decisions that, that they, they want to make uh, or that they do make or the struggles that they have? There's a game called um, uh, That Dragon Cancer, which I think is an absolute masterwork. Uh, it's, it, I, think, I don't think any game will be made that's better than that, uh, just in terms of empathy. Okay, thank you. So now this was our last presentation for today. Um, please, all of our speakers, Patrick and Philomena, um, join our stage, turn on your cameras and your microphones. Um, I will have my wonderful fairy, Laura Stalder in the background who will be shooting me the questions. Um, we will have questions that will be asked either to uh, one of you um, individually or questions that will be asked to all of you and then also feel free to um, start a discussion with one each other on the panel. So the first question um, I'm going to ask is for, for Patrick. Um, talking about experimental games, what is the topic you've enjoyed uh, you've enjoyed experimenting with the most and why? I mean, I think in some ways, so there are a couple of ways to answer this. One is like uh, a phenomena. I, I also work on a lot of games that have to do with science, but through public health. So I work with a medical doctor who focuses on uh, sexual health and reproductive justice. And we make games primarily for high school students to help them uh, look at things like sexually transmitted infections or uh, forms of sex positivity. So not just the kind of like medical stuff that's very antiseptic, but also thinking about positive kinds of relationships. Um, and that's challenging because like making a game about uh, sexual health sounds like the least engaging thing possible, right? So finding ways um, into that becomes a really fun challenge. Um, and the other thing is, I think, like very similarly to Brenda, when I'm not working in like the explicitly serious game space or educational game space, I really think a lot about affect and emotion. Um, so, like when I said that I'm really uh, committed to thinking about mechanics, for me, a game mechanic as a piece of game grammar is precisely the place where affect, emotion, and feeling can be explored because it's the thing that the player does in a game. So it's not merely about representing something. It's not just putting a series of graphics on the screen or telling a story through text, but inviting someone to engage in a series of actions that may include complicity. So I certainly think about uh, Brenda's games um, when I'm doing that kind of design. I also think about games like uh, you know, um, uh, Jonathan Blow's Braid, for instance, or Spec Ops The Line, or, you know, many other games in which the player is asked to follow a set of rules, and then those rules are flipped on them. And we do that a lot in alternate reality games, and then invite the players to interpret what they think that complicity is like, and incorporate what it is that the players are doing into the design. So because we create these games over several months, so it isn't just a piece of software that's put out into the world, we can adjust day to day um, in response to how the players themselves are producing meaning in response to a system. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is for Philomena. Um, and the question is, have you ever studied game theory as in mathematics and its implication in biology? I am designing an ecology, ecology game for my project and I wonder if it is an avenue worth pursuing. So I've certainly studied a lot of game theory since I also, that's what I studied uh, for four and a half years and then yeah, a bit beyond. Um, I don't think I directly connected it to the implications in biology. But I think as a game designer, you start to see game mechanics everywhere. You start to see game mechanics when you go across the screen uh, and you have the like the, the red and the blue light, if you can go or not. So you kind of, the whole world becomes systems in a way. And especially also in science, you start to see how these different systems play together and influence each other. That is why from the beginning, these five pillars of population genetics were interesting to me because I saw directly that, hey, this has some kind of aspects of game mechanics. And I absolutely think it's worth uh, pursuing. 
ecology and their implications of game theory inside ecology. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Thanks for answering that. Um, next question is for Brenda. How often do you collaborate with science institutions or subject matter experts to develop new games? All the time, <laughs> you know, it, it depends on what I'm doing. Um, so if I'm, when I'm making a commercial game, like I, I just, uh, just finished Empire of Sin late last year, and I talked with plenty of experts uh, from the 19, you know, who, who studied the 1920s um, or who studied the gangsters who existed at that time. When I was working on a game like Train, I consulted lots of, um, lots of experts there as well. Uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that I that I I want to make sure that I do the necessary research into any subject matter. I think one of the one of the best strengths that any game designer can have is assuming that they don't know everything. Um, and you know, even the worst case scenario is you're going to reach out and you're going to talk to somebody and they're going to tell you everything you know. And the, great, then they reinforce it, right? But that's that's never been the case. Um, but yeah, so whatever whatever, if I'm working on a unique subject matter. I, I will always find uh, I will always find subject matter experts. That's a, that's a pretty normal thing, especially working in um, historical simulations like I tend to do. Right. Um, this is a similar question that I asked Philomena after her presentation, right? And um, as I recall, your answer was that um, you also have um, this this exchange with different people. Also, like it's very community based. If you would release something that is not correct, the community would directly react to that. So, Patrick, may I ask you, how is it with you and your experience? Yeah, I mean, we do, you know, like like most game designers, we engage in a lot of play testing. Um, it's a little bit tricky for kind of like large scale games where you have uh, hundreds or thousands of people playing at the same time. Um, and it's not just about them interacting with the systems. It's also about, say, them being on a platform like Twitch. And even if I can test something with 20 people or something and make sure the mechanics work the way that they're supposed to, it's harder to test how that social interaction is is going to go down but but we do our best to um to do a lot of i guess what's called human-centered design um so for instance i'm working on another game about climate change now um that i hope to scale up to to multiple seventh grade uh classrooms or even different schools um we've worked a lot with high school students and college students and are realizing that going back early to middle school might be a good idea for thinking about climate change. And so we did a, a week long pilot um, a couple of weeks ago uh, where I just taught a science class for a week and learned what the seventh graders were like, what they liked, what they didn't like. We gave them surveys, we gave them focus groups, uh, we gave them quests to complete, we gave them little digital modules. It wasn't the entire game, but it was like little bits and pieces. And so now we have a lot of information to work with as we develop the final version of that game. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question, actually, I'm staying with Patrick here, um, is where do you see the biggest benefit of players not surely knowing if they are in a game and does that come with downsides? Yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of fear about this kind of thing and I understand why. Like, I mean, given the last few years and how much misinformation there's been and there's always been misinformation and propaganda but it's become worse because of algorithms, <clears throat> sorry, um, because of algorithms <laughs> and the kind of things that we see on Facebook, for instance. And so um, this is something to really push against in some ways. Um, so QAnon is an example of this, right? A lot of people have described the QAnon conspiracy as being like an alternate reality game where nobody calls it a game, but the people engage with it as if it were, and yet it has very serious implications, right? Something like the capital attack, for instance, was in many, many ways motivated by those series of online conspiracies. At the same time, I think because we live in this kind of, you know, this moment that's been called post-truth or moment of alternative facts, I actually think these kinds of games are fabulous at getting people to think about their media environments in critical ways and to engage them differently. Like I actually think there's something about not being 100% sure about the status of the event that you're engaging in that makes a difference. So like if we go back to like literary theory, 
in the 19th century, there was this idea of suspension of disbelief. So suspension of disbelief is what we do when you, we read a novel or we watch a film. Like part of us goes like into the world of the fiction and almost like pretends like it's real. Like you never really think the novel you're reading is real, but you have to suspend disbelief enough to go with it. And that's powerful in its own way. But what I love about alternate reality games is instead of suspending disbelief, they produce belief. And I think the, the thing to be careful about there is you don't wanna turn your game into a cult or something like that, right? So you always wanna have debriefs. You wanna have moments that are kind of like out of game and you wanna make sure that you're constantly negotiating consent with your players. And I think, you know, consent is a really important part of any game, but especially a game that lasts for months and includes dynamic interactions among people. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is going to Filomena. And the question is, why did you choose to focus on the topic of population genetics? And where do you see the power of educating the players specifically on genetics? I think in this case, it was just my personal preference because it was the one topic in biology that interested me the most. So it was basically evolution and genetics, which comes together in population genetics. And after reading through different topics um, that were potential bachelor game candidates, uh, it seemed this one had a really wide variety of game mechanics that I could use, basically. So that is where it came from. I think it's great to learn about everything. So everybody should make a game about whatever they're interested in and then I can play it and I will learn a bunch um, and have a lot of fun while doing that. So yeah, everybody pick your favorite topic and make a game mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or a topic that you care about. Yeah, right, I agree. Like when your passion is behind that, that's mostly um, like the, the secret ingredient for, for a product that will be awesome and loved by everyone. Um, the next question is actually a question to all of you. And the question is, um, what's your creative process like? And what is the most challenging aspect of game development? Mm. Maybe Brenda, if you wanna if you wanna begin. Well, the most challenging aspect is finishing. I mean, it's easy to start a game. Uh, it's really easy to start a game. It's really hard to ship one. Um, and then I, my creative process is I just become fascinated in something, almost always a system. Um, I'll see something I like, I become obsessed with it. I keep reading about it, you know, in the case of my current game, it's, you know, it's, it's about prohibition uh, in Chicago in the 1920s. And, uh, you know, I was fascinated with prohibition from the time I was a kid. And eventually that leads to coming out in a game. So, you know, any look at my bookshelf will tell you probably what I will be making a game about. Not even, I may not even be aware of it. I may just be, have this fascination. Uh, but for me, that's usually where it starts. I, I study the systems and then figure out where the player is going to go in those systems. I think part of finishing a game is also letting a game go. So there is mm. always so much stuff that you want to put in there. It's not just the work you have to do to reach goal X that you set at the start, but you will find so many more things that you want to add in the process. And then at some point you have to call it a day and finish it up and it, it can be hard to let go. I was, it frustrated me quite a bit when we said, okay, this game is now done. We have to move on to the next one. It took me, it took me a week to get over it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, it's a mix of, um, of reading a lot. I mean, just like, you know, as you all have described, like really learning the subject matter and becoming passionate about it. And then also playing like other people's games in some cases, right? I mean, like creative writers are told all the time, like if you wanna write novels, you have to read a lot of novels, not in order to imitate them, but to know like what the state of the game basically is. And so like, I love like every now and again, finding a game that just like blows my mind and then like reverse engineering, like why did it blow my mind? Like, what are the things that could be built upon here? Why is this different from things that I've seen in the past? Um, and that's the exciting part. And then I would think, say, specifically with alternate reality games, the challenge is um, how do you keep the game going and how do you respond to what players are doing? So oftentimes we'll do like months of planning to run one of these games, build a ton of assets, 
and then the game starts running and the players break it in some way, not through like bugs or things like that, but because they had a different set of inter interpretations about who the main character was or where the story was going. And so the challenge is oftentimes adapting in real time um, to take their input and their ideas and incorporate them into the game as it's, it's unfolding and make everything consistent as you're doing that. Also, when it comes to commercial games, at least for me, expectation management is also always a thing. So you show an image and people will project something into that image. And then you show a video and people will still project other things into it than what you're actually doing. And it can be very hard to yeah, keep everybody grounded in what they actually can expect in what it will be. Or otherwise you will get some backlash out of that. People have huge fantasies. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> that's like that that's like the example um when when you have a conversation with someone and you talk about a dog and one might think of a little chihuahua and the other one might think of a like very big Doberman and you talk yeah. about dogs, but you have like so different uh, pictures in mind. And it might like when you're talking, you know, about the same but you don't really reach each other on that on that base. Um, I'm wondering where do you all get your inspirations from, and do you have any examples? Hmm. I mean, they're everywhere. I think Philomena said it well. You know, it's just these, once you start as a game designer, you see everything. At least I do in terms of systems. Um, so I have to whatever it is, I have to care about it enough to stick with it for usually five years if it's a video game. So I better really be into it. Um, but I, I, I just try to find things that, that, that are fascinating to me or games that I want to play that don't exist uh, and then, then make them. There's also the other way around. So I also personally usually come from a topic and then make it into a game. But there's also a lot of people who come from a mechanic, right? That mm. do it like on a very abstract basis. They find a very fun mechanic like Tetris or something. And then they turn that into a game. And then the topic is usually added later. So that is also an approach on where you can come from. Yeah, and another idea, maybe I, I agree with both of those. Um, is something like I think a lot about genres and how they're constructed. I, of course, like genres are different in storytelling, like the Western or film noir um, versus games where, mechan where me mechanic mechanics oftentimes name genres. So like real time strategy or first person shooter. But um, I, I worked on, a, on an alternate reality game a few years ago uh, for about uh, 2000 people where I started with the genre of the secret society and just kind of became obsessed with this kind of like elitist form that you see at places like Yale, for instance, um, you know, Skull and Bones or something like that. And these like these organizations that depend upon hazing and self-reproduction. And I thought to myself, what would a secret society look like if it wasn't about hazing and it wasn't about self-reproduction, but it was about constant change where you could let in like people who like hadn't been a part of that organization historically thinking about like I was making this for students. So thinking about like queer students or students of color or first generation students who like wouldn't have been part of secret societies. And so a big part of the process there had to do with like not starting with like the happy secret society, starting with what people recognize, right? Everybody knows what a secret society is from TV, from movies, from reading. And so to give them a version of what they understood and then to flip it 180 when they were like far enough into the process. So, so I oftentimes just like think about the structure of genres. Right. Um, I want to jump back to something that Philomena said before in talking about um, expectation management. How often do you apply a user-centric um, approach to game development? And how often do you find a game idea through what potential users recommend? I'm totally curious how you all will answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> so since we have a, our studio has a fairly community-based approach. So we always listen to what they want to play. And um, if that like correlates well with what we want the game to be, then we usually go ahead and do it. 
I think in terms of the ideas, we, <laughs> hard question. So as if you make a commercial game, you also always have to think about if you want to sustain your studio, is this something that people actually care mm -hmm. about? So it's definitely easier to come from a topic point of view. So when we decided to make this game where you build a city on the back of a huge animal, we thought that, yeah, probably the, the genre is very popular and it will look very cool in the visual kind of way. So we think that we can like um, generate some buzz with some visuals for this game. And, but then also the part of, is this really a game that we want to make and the topic that we want to make? And then we have to take both into account. And if we find a good mix, that is usually what we're going with. I think uh, with I mean, commercial, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, Brenda. Um, with commercial games, you, you especially once they're live, uh, you know, because games can live in DLC for years and years and years, you know, the game, it's yours before it goes out. And then once it's out, it's theirs, right? So then, then the responsibility is, um, you know, making yourself available. Uh, so we are, you know, we on launch the community team triples to make sure that we're getting all the possible feedback. And then as game director, my role is really to sort of be a doctor. Right, so I'm hearing all the symptoms about what people don't like, and then figuring out how do I how do I take those symptoms and then make the game fun. Um, and sometimes, you know, people there's sometimes you know things that they already have that if you take those things away, even if those things are critical to making the game better because they're exploits, people you know they don't necessarily like that. So sometimes it's a lot of a lot of it's down to messaging. But with commercial games. Um, so much of the will players like that, that, is, that happens before the game is even funded. You know, you, you really have to have an exceptional, exceptional case for that. Like, like train, if I had tried to make train commercially, there is zero chance that would have game gotten, would have, it would have gotten funded. Zero chance. I mean, I'm sure it would now, but I don't want to make more than one of them. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, historically, like I've worked more on games that were like in the realm of research or lear learning or serious games. And like only recently I've started working on games that could have commercial applications. So what I'm about to say is a little bit different, but um, we, we take a lot of community uh, input in the games that we make. We're located on the south side of Chicago, which is uh, a mostly black and brown uh, set of neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, and our, our, our team is like, is very diverse, but we're always looking at like that set of communities because games usually aren't made for them or like historically haven't been made for them. And so it is a different set of reactions. Um, but, you know, one, one example is we made a, a board game called Smokestacks. So basically like smoking rates among young people had gone down, but started shooting back up in recent years. And so we made this game where in the first version, you were playing as a potential customer and the players like didn't find this interesting. And so we were like, oh man, like rather than revising this, we just have to like do a 180. And so what we decided to do is to have the players play as tobacco companies who were generating like media strategies and picking products and trying to sell those products as broadly as they possibly could. And players got really excited about playing as tobacco companies. And as the game went on, they realized that that position of power was really problematic because their customers would start to die off based on the rule set of the board game. So that ended up being a much more dynamic and effective route um, and even though that idea didn't come from the community, the critique of the first game did and allowed us to get into a very different uh, and more creative headspace. Thank you. Um, the next question that I have um, is also not specific for anyone. It's for everyone who wants to answer the question. Um, and it's what, what aspect of game development do you enjoy the most and why? For example, environments or characters, storytelling? Mm. I like storytelling. I mean, it's just, it's the kind of games I've always been drawn to. I've been playing Disco Elysium over and over and over. And like, I love multi-linear games. I love um, games that tell emotional and personal stories, historical stories, um, stories that have to do with politics in some way. Um, and so for me, obviously that's only one kind of game. Like, you know, like I love playing non-narrative games too, like Tetris or Candy Crush or, um, or, or larger kind of open world games. But I really, um, you know, as someone who started 
uh, with reading fiction and watching visual media. Um, it's that aspect of games and how they innovated that I that I keep being drawn to. Talking about storytelling, what what kind of storytelling I mostly enjoy in games is uh, immersion storytelling. So also designing immersion storytelling. So I love to put some system into place and then something happens and players are starting to make their own stories about what is happening. Oh, so for example, with the genetics game, oh, now I only have one single mom and she had twins. How are we going to survive this? And oh, but this predator didn't attack us. Maybe they knew each other from their were kids and so on. And then I really love, and then may, they make you, lots of videos about it and they have their little role play thing going on. And I really just love to see these stories coming out of systems. I didn't write any mm. of these, they just happen. Yeah, I think mine would be a very similar answer. I, um, I, I, I'm a systems designer and have been for, for a very long time. I, the thing I love about games and now is when I have an idea for something or somebody says, I wonder how we would do something. And I can't immediately go, oh, I might do blah, 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 blah. Like if I get stuck, then I, that is a, a really sure sign that I will be fascinated in whatever it is. If it is not an easy solution, people haven't done it before, that's where I start to get, you know, particularly interested. Also, uh, of, sorry, also, of course, course um, prototyping is super fun. I think that's the it case is. for most, for yeah. most game developers. So at the beginning, you don't have to care about the code being structured well. Not everything has to work. You can just throw it in there. Everything is possible. That is just great. And then over time, you have to go into all the details and fix all the bugs where it gets a bit more tedious, but also sometimes a lot more interesting when you see all the systems come together. So now that we're talking about also digital and analog um, games, I do want to know what is um, your view on what do you think educates more efficiently these days and why the analog or the digital games? I want to say neither. I, I think they're both great and I work on both of them. But the, the thing that I found um, that's extremely effective is teaching people how to be game designers themselves. Like I really love working with people and asking them about what matters to them and why and what their personal experience is and then leading them through a design process, usually with analog games, to be honest, because it's easier to design without a longer development cycle, um, especially for first order games, and it's easier to get, um, get feedback. Um, this maybe isn't true of adults, but when I'm working with, uh, with middle school or high school or college students, um, they learn so much about a subject matter by having to construct a system themselves, even if the system is faulty, even if it's something that like we as game designers wouldn't recognize as being polished or working particularly well, it's useful as a kind of um, heuristic or a pedagogy. So I don't have any preference in um, analog or digital games being more educational. I think you can make great educational games with either of them. And it really depends on how and what you want to show with the game. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll go, I'll take a, a stance for analog games. Um, analog games, most people have access to a piece of paper as compared to a computer. So I, I grew up uh, from, from, a, I'm from a lower income background. There was a zero chance I would have been anywhere near a computer if I hadn't gotten a job um, when I was 15. So uh, I, I also, along with what Patrick said, I've, I've, had, I've done a lot, of, um, a lot of workshops with young kids about uh, creating board games about historical subject matter. And I remember this young kid who got really excited about creating a game about President Taft like who, who would get excited about that? But he was super excited to create a game. Uh, and so uh, you, I've, it, even, like, even my most recent commercial game started out as an analog game because analog game is just like, well, that didn't work, you threw away the paper. You know, whereas coder time and artist time and you know, dev team time is, is really pretty pricey. Uh, but I think, it's, I think the thing that truly separates um, analog and digital is, is privilege. Not everybody has an access to a computer or even electricity. Uh, 
So if, you know, it, and games can be widely disseminated, especially educational games can be widely disseminated in print um, versus uh, uh, electronically to, to people who otherwise may not be able to experience them. I, I totally agree. I mean, just to add one thing, like in addition to boosting analog games as a general category, like I also really love tabletop games, like storytelling games where, you know, I've been playing with a group of people for over a year now in, on a single campaign, not Dungeons and Dragons, but like something like a, a different kind of world. Um, and that's so magical too, because like you don't really need any technology for that. I mean, yeah, may, maybe you need paper to keep track of certain kinds of things. Um, but that can be so powerful. And, and the prototyping that you all are talking about too, like I remember at one point we had this summer camp for high school students where they were making games about uh, drugs and alcohol and which was very specific to the South side and policing um, as well. And they created this game that had to do with, uh, with pot, with, with marijuana specifically before it, had, before it became legalized in Illinois. And um, for their exhibition of their game after a few weeks of designing this and working on it, um, uh, a couple of police officers came by to this thing and, and these students ended up having this like totally like intense conversation with police officers that was like totally, you know, um, uh, direct and emotional, but where they actually came to something. So, so the game, the game was interesting in a lot of ways, but it was more like an analog occasion for a conversation, which was really powerful. Do you believe that it's it sounds very very powerful and um i want to jump in um short and do a follow-up question about what you have been discussing before and the question is if one were to start developing games with no previous experience which tool would you recommend using and why so i started also with paper and uh <laughs> cardboards so or outside with friends where you run around and you just make up rules everybody is a game designer um, if the question is specifically about digital games i personally started with game maker and um, then moved into unity but there's also other things like for example scratch is i think very popular currently uh, also with kids any other suggestions um, I paper, I think, is exceptional to start with, you know, just to just to make games and um, even to have like there, there are plenty of people I know that even have game making clubs where they just, you know, they talk about, OK, tonight we're going to make a game about uh, a, a bunch of mechanics who get stuck in a zoo like, you know, and, and I quite obviously just made that terrible example up. Um, but I, I do feel that with digital games, a, a really good place to start um, is with modding. So if you are, you know, the, the mod community, so many people that are in the game industry now got their start making game mods uh, and lots of games are moddable. Typically we would say that those are first person, you know, people would think of first person shooters, but you know, like for instance, many of Paradox's games are, are moddable and those are historical simulations. So, uh, you know, take a look at modding. It really gets you, gets you a chance to look under the hood a bit um, and to create something on a system, on, in a system that already exists. And then as you understand more about how digital games are built and how single changes can, you know, go out over, uh, can, can have bigger effects over time, uh, then, you know, I do think Unity is, is also an excellent suggestion. Another yeah, thing... I, I love that answer. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, one other thing that is always fun to do independently of if you're just starting out or if you're an experienced game developer joining Game Jams, because it really yeah. just helps you to keep things small. So if you make your first game, it will usually be much too big. So you will probably never finish it because it's very hard to scale your ideas at the very beginning. And these game jams, um, they happen every once in a while, I think every few weeks. Um, Ludum Dare, for example, give you a topic and like two days and then you make what you can in these two days and they give you a great, and then you play what other people made and other people play your game and give you feedback and it's a very good starting point to grow as a game designer because you interact with others and you will get feedback for your game that sounds like it. a lot of fun <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of fun i, I love both these ideas of, of modding and game jams um i mean i guess i would add like in addition to the medium of like paper or pen and paper 
um, like this is building on what Philomena was saying, like your, your body too. Like I sometimes have students create like, you know, like room-based games. Of course we have like tag and hide and seek and stuff like that. There are a lot of folk games uh, that depend like merely on, on bodies or, or speech or whatever. And, and I give them like different constraints in terms of what, what they can and can't do with bodies. And they do interesting things with that. On the digital side, just to, I, I agree with obviously like working your way up to Unity as the kind of the key platform or, or software, but um, Twine is something I work with my, my students on as well. It's a really, you can learn it in 30 minutes, like the basics at least, and create at least multi-linear narratives. They're not usually games, but there are ways of adding stat systems and there are ways of adding things that start to look a lot like video games pretty rapidly. Right. So um, we only have like two or three minutes left and I would like to first go a little bit in the perspective of the future. And I would love to know, what do you think will your own work change like in the future, let's say in the next 10 or 20 years? It will probably get even easier to make games. So in the last 10 years or so, we have seen such a big development in tools. Now we have all these cool 3D scanning techniques. So I think more people will be able to express themselves more easily in the medium. And we will see a lot more things being made that we would have never imagined from anybody who has an idea, basically. Yeah, I would say, I think my, I've written two games recently, which are, one is a sort of choose your own adventure. Um, and another is, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's a narrative game in a board game um, that's sort of single player. Anyway, I'm, I'm just making, I'm, I'm getting to a point, I guess my, I still continue to be a commercial game developer and that commercial game development has certain rules that go with it. Uh, but on my personal game development stuff, you know, all bets are off. I'm, I'm taking subjects that are interesting and, and trying to make games about them, interesting to me and trying to make games about them, things that, um, that people haven't made a game about that I know of, like the one that'll be published soon um, in a magazine, no less, uh, is a game about infertility. It's a board game about infertility. Uh, so, so I'm just, I'm just I, 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 for me, I want to continue exploring topics um, that not everybody might talk about or certainly turn into a game. That's great. So I more mean, of the same. <laughs> I mean, that sounds different too. Um, like for me, I'm really interested in this, to see where augmented reality goes. I mean, especially for kind of like mixed reality games that I've been working on. Um, you can look at a game like Pokemon Go and there's a lot of formal potential there in terms of the spatial and networked possibilities. Like I don't think Pokemon Go is an especially interesting game as a game, but the network they were able to produce is tremendous. And to be able to think about how to take, tell a distributed story with that kind of infrastructure is just, there's so many possibilities there. And then um, for, for me too, like, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to work on like larger multi-linear uh, story video games. I mean, I think that's the, for me personally, that's the next place I want to go. Yeah, I agree with the Pokemon Go. I really enjoyed to see how Pokemon Go also with the years has like added more and more gamification like values and more and more um, aspects of different, like catching different people, the collectors and the fighters and like those different mindsets of people what they enjoy in a game. Um, so one more question and then we'll have to wrap it up. And it's a short question with short answers. What is your favorite game? Hmm. I'll go with Civ Rev, like when I, in my talk, Civilization Revolution. Uh, in my talk, I was talking about staying up too late last night playing a game, and I stayed up too late last night playing a game. Started <laughs> at 10 and finished it like half one. So, um, yeah, but I'll say that's my favorite game. I've been playing it for years. It's a great game. It really is. I love it. <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean, the game that I've put like way too much time into is Stardew Valley, like hundreds and hundreds of hours. Uh, have had many late nights in the last few years. Um, but uh, going back further, I think like a game that was really inspirational to me was Earthbound uh, for the Super Nintendo uh, back in the 90s. For me, the game I put way too many hours in is uh, RimWorld. <laughs> um, seems we're all a bit on the on the simulation game side here. 
but probably, and I have many favorite games, but maybe the one that influenced me most is uh, the Creature series. Mm. I don't know if, if you even know about it. It's one of the first games where there were creatures which had a very, very advanced um, intelligence. So you could really interact with them and they could learn how to speak. And that really showed me what these computer creatures are capable of, basically. Perfect. Thank you so, so much. So our time is over, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much again, uh, Patrick, Filomena and Brenda for uh, your great um, presentations and also the very, very interesting Q uh, question and answer session that we just had. I love the discussions. Um, and that's how I'm going to wrap up. So I'm sure if you still have questions among each other's um, you can gladly stay in touch. Uh, if there are any other questions from, from any of our participants, um, also we will still be happy to answer. And uh, with that, see you next time at the next uh, Laser Boston. Bye.